evening, Hofstra fans. I'm Danny DiCrescenzo, and welcome to Sports Speak. The big topic of tonight's show is men's basketball. Between NBA All-Star Weekend and the Hofstra Pride winning 10 straight, there is so much to talk about in the world of men's hoops. From the court to the racetrack, Olivia Hillstead is here to recap the Daytona 500 from this past weekend. And later in the show, we will hear from Tim Crowley, who caught up with the reigning CAA baseball champions, and Julia Cavanaugh, who will bring us an update on the rest of Pride Sports. We have an exciting show ahead, so don't go away, Hofstra fans, because Sports Beat starts right now. The NBA season is entering its final stretch after the All-Star break this weekend. Here to break it down with me is Kevin Bunk. Now, Kevin, I think some mid-season superlatives are in order. We'll go our all-NBA picks at the midway point, including our MVP. So I want to start with center because I think that is a very obvious choice. Nik Nikola Jokic, 25-12-10, shooting, 31.8 PER. He's my MVP. He's my MVP. Also, this is the third year in a row he's going to be an MVP. I have no doubt that he finishes the season strong like he has been for the last three years. Um, and he's going to be the first team All-NBA center once again. It's, it's, it's a shame he denies Embiid the honor, but that's what great players do. They make sure nobody else eats. Moving over to the forwards, I have Giannis Antetokounmpo and I have LeBron James. Now, I know I'm a Lakers fan, so I may be biased, but I think LeBron has just put together an exceptional year, 38-7, 50% shooting in his age 38 season, and Giannis, another stellar year for the Greek Freak, 31-12-5, and 28.4 PER, 6.4 win shares. I know you differ on that LeBron pick. Well, Giannis, I'll touch on him first really quick. I think he's the best player in basketball. Absolute no doubter for me to be my number four in the All-NBA team. But LeBron and Jason Tatum, it was kind of a coin toss for me. I'm going to go with Tatum. I think that having the best team in the NBA goes a long way when you're in competition with someone who's a 13 seed right now. And while it may not be LeBron's fault, he's putting together a great season, I have to take that into account. And aside from Luka Doncic, who will be one of the guards that we talk about here, I think Tatum's the best bucket getter in the league. If you have one more shot that you got to take, I'm giving it to Tatum now. I like Tatum, but again, I think LeBron, not only is he playing equally well, but the voters will have sympathy for his campaign, even if the Lakers are struggling. And when it comes to the guards, I think we're in agreement about Luka Doncic. We both saw his 60-point, 20-rebound explosion against the Knicks. He's one of the game's greatest young players ever. I think what he's doing at this age is exceptional. But I want to talk about our second guard pick really quickly. I'll start with you. Who do you have? Well, I'm going with Ja Moran. Ja averaging 27, 6, and 8 on 46% shooting. He's one of the best teams in the Western Conference. A weaker Western Conference, might I add, which doesn't help his case. But I think he's just the most explosive guard in the league right now. And his playmaking ability is very underrated. In the big moment in the playoffs, maybe will he shine? But that doesn't factor into the All-NBA team here. That's why Ja is my one. I have Jimmy Butler, and I know that's a little bit of a controversy here in the Sports Beat set among the producers as well. But for sure, Jimmy is putting in quietly a pretty solid season. 22-6-5, and five, two steals a game. That's ties for his career high. Here's the big number. .242 win shares per 48, third in the league. He plays defense. He rebounds. He's a team player, one of the most bought-in stars in the league. I think Jimmy will have a great second half, and that transitions to our next talking point, which is about the Eastern Conference. The Nets in rebuild mode after shipping off their two stars to the West. Cleveland is already the fourth seed, but will the Cavs stay there to compete with Milwaukee, to compete with Boston, to compete with Philly? Who do you have maybe taking that mantle if it's not Cleveland? I think Cleveland certainly stays there because you look at the two teams behind them, and I know that one of them is your choice, but the <laughs> Knicks and the Heat, I think the Knicks are going to slide after this, to be quite honest. Oh, yeah, Knicks fans too. aren't going to be too happy with that, <laughs> but they played at their peak going into the All-Star break, so the worst time to have a break is when you're playing your best basketball for a period of time. I don't think Randall and Brunson can sustain the level of success they had over the last month and a half. R.J. Barrett's been a non-factor for the Knicks, so because of those reasons and the reasons that I will talk about with the Heat in the next couple minutes here, 
I'm going to have to go with Cleveland. I think Cleveland's a really good, exciting young team. They're the best defensive team in the NBA, Danny. The East still runs through Cleveland. <laughs> I love Cleveland too, but I have the seventh seed Miami Heat making a late season surge. One of the best defensive teams in the league, and this is their problem. They're a pedestrian offensive team. Nobody on their team is shooting above 37% from three. But they just got Kevin Love, who's a career above 35% shooter. Hill's numbers will go up. He's got a rebounding rate of 20.2%, which if he qualified to actually lead the league would be spectacular. He's going to make a big impact on this Miami team. And think if Gabe Vincent and Max Struess actually start hitting shots and if Bam Adebayo keeps playing well and Jimmy turns it up a notch, South Beach could be in the conversation for that fourth best team in the East. I don't really buy it, but to give you some props on it and to go with the pick a little bit, Best coach team in the league, best ran organization in the league, in my opinion, over the last decade. It's almost undoubtable. Um, Kevin Love overlooked signing. Oh, yeah. Because now a veteran player who's won a championship is getting a key role on a playoff team, which he didn't have before. I think it's an underrated signing. It could make some noise for the Heat. You hear the name Kevin Love, but you remember he's really transitioned into the sixth man not a 3 and D guy, but a 3 and rebound guy. And that's something that could make a big splash in South Beach. And that's going to be that's going to do it for our panel with Kevin Buck. So, Kevin, thank you. Love talking to the NBA with you, as always. In addition to NBA All-Star Weekend, this past weekend was also an exciting one for NASCAR fans. Here to recap the Daytona 500 is Olivia Hillstead. Hey, Sports Beat fans. I'm Olivia Hillstead, and welcome to your Daytona 500 update. The 65th running of the Great American Race took place this past Sunday, with Ricky Stenhouse Jr. winning in overtime for his first ever victory in the prestigious race. Daniel Suarez brought out a caution with three laps to go, forcing the race into overtime for a green, white, checkered finish. Stenhouse took the lead, heading down the backstretch on the restart, but a collision between Austin Dillon and William Byron set, the crash, set off a crash, collecting 13 cars in the big one, enforcing yet another overtime period. Now leading the field to the green flag, Stenhouse battled Joey Logano side by side for the lead. It was just a nose ahead when the caution flew on the final lap for another major wreck behind them. The race finished under caution, with Stenhouse becoming the 42nd different driver to win the race. This victory wasn't only special for the driver, but the team as well. JT Doherty racing with co-owners Jody Jeschichter and former NBA player Brad Doherty became the first team co-owned by a black man and a woman to win the race. Not only that, this was the longest Daytona 500 in history, with fans getting an extra 12 laps or 30 miles of racing beyond the advertised distance. Behind Stenhouse, Joey Logano finished second, Christopher Bell third, Chris Buescher in fourth, and pole sitter Alex Bowman rounding out the top five. Extreme sports legend Travis Pastrana was also in the field for this race and came away with an incredibly impressive 11th place. After an exciting start to the season, the NASCAR Cup Series is back on track next Sunday for the Auto Club 400 at Auto Club Speedway in California. For your NASCAR update, I'm Olivia Hillstead. Coming up, we will take a trip to the baseball diamond to catch up with the reigning CAA champs. Stick around because there's more sports beat up next. Hey you, yeah, you. Have you ever wanted your work to be featured on live TV? Then Director's Cut is the show for you. But Katie, how do I apply? It's easy, just follow these three simple steps. First, go to our Instagram at Director's Cut HU. And while you're there, give us a follow. Next, click the link in our bio. Finally, select the guest submission form and send us your best work. All submissions are welcome from your 27s to your senior films. Cereal's good. It's like we never leave here at Hofstra today. Last season, the Hofstra men's baseball team became CAA champs for the first time in program history. Tim Crowley had the chance to catch up with the team last week and even got some tips on his own swing. Let's take a look. Baseball season's officially back on Long Island. With weather like this, it's an awesome start to the year. Because of that, I'm starting to get the itch again. I'm going on like year four of being a washed up baseball player. So I think it's time for me to get my swing back in order. And who better to do that with than the reigning CAA champions, the Hofstra Pride. I'm Tim Crowley, joined by Hofstra infielder Zach Bailey. Zach, appreciate the time. How you doing, guys? So you were part of an offense last year that was a great contact team. 
hard to strike out, and obviously unbelievably clutch late in games with all those walk-offs. What made last year's offense so special? Uh, honestly, you know, we didn't really have a philosophy of like don't strike out with two strikes. We were just kind of gritty batters. You know, we didn't want to get out ourselves. Obviously, it sucks going back to the dugout with a strikeout under your belt. So we just wanted to make contact. So as you get ready to go, obviously the season coming up, you guys have been working hard. When you're in the cage with T-Work, what are kind of the big things mechanically that you're trying to work on for your swing? So mostly I'm thinking about putting the ball to the right side. I don't really want to pull the ball because in the game that'll make you pull off. So I'm really focused on getting my hands through the ball and just pushing to the right side. I always want to be handsy with it. You don't want to be too stiff with your hands. So I, I, I got to watch you first because I'm on four years, no swing. So we, we got to let the experts do the work so far. And so for you, especially when you're trying to work the other way, will there be times where you're working on different edges of the tee that right, I want to work on something inside, we're getting back here. Obviously, that's when you're trying to let the ball travel through. Yeah, so I'll move the tee around uh, during my rounds of BP. So sometimes I'll come low and in just so I can really work on extending my hands through the ball. I mean, give, one, we'll give you one of those right there, too. These are tough. you stopping yourself but if you stop yourself and you're like this... Yeah. And then I'll probably switch it, either go to the middle, work on the outside part of the plate. I'll go high T, high T outside, just so I can work on throwing my hands through the top of the zone. And so talk to me just in, in terms of your load too, because again, some guys it, it's as simple as a little toe tap. For some guys it's you know, the bigger so leg kick as well. Low, know, For you, just kind of what goes through your mind weight transfer wise to keep everything back when you're coming through? So my load, I normally just have a little leg kick into the landing. I want to stay balanced all the way through the load. And then when I'm coming through, it's kind of one motion. So land, go. So for me, I know one thing we have to correct at Evan told too many times I have this flamingo kick is what they used to call it in terms of just trying to get the load down. So I guess that's the biggest thing we got to work on today. So I'll, I'll just start inside left handed wise. What needs, you know, what's kind of the big function when I'm trying to come through? This is going on like four years without a competitive swing. So I, this is going to be like a rollover to second. Not bad. Uh, I mean, you were standing a little close to the tee. You can maybe lower it a little bit, but you're kind of locked up there. Try to loosen your hands up a little bit. Your hands were stiff. You want to have like knuckles touching knuckles. Right. Make sure it's as loose as possible. I like to think top, bottom hand a little bit tighter on the bat. Top hand, just let it sit into the palm of your hand just so you can get that push through the zone. So we got for an adjustment. You can take another step back, be a little closer. Yeah. That way? Yep. Oh, yeah. I think there's a career in coaching after this. <laughs> you know, I, I actually coach kids sometimes. I like coaching kids. It's fun spreading my knowledge to other people. What's the age group you're usually working with? Um, anywhere from like 8 to 14 years old. What's kind of the big things you try to preach to them? Because obviously there's kids that want to come out and they want to have every minute detail. There's kids that just want to come out and play. What, what are kind of some of the big things you like to tell them when you're working with them? The biggest thing I like to think, and it's my philosophy, always be on time for the fastball. You know, you're going to get other off-speed pitches, but especially at a young age, like you need to be on time for that fastball. No one's going to blow anything by you. The fastball is the hardest pitch he's going to throw. Let's see if I can get one more pitch. We'll try to go away. And if I can still hit a line drive without rolling over, then I, I think this is job well done. Oh yeah, it's a line drive. We'll take it. <laughs> Heading into this season again, there's there's so many expectations with this team in terms of everybody coming back, the championship team that's returning. How far can this team go in year two under Coach Catalanato? You know, I believe that we do have a better team than last year. We have uh, added a lot of kids to our pitching staff, a lot of pitchers. Um, the, team, the lineup came back, same exact lineup that we have. Definitely going to put the ball in play. I think our swings have gotten a lot better. Our philosophy at the plate has gotten a lot better. I think we're going to do better than we did last year, honestly. Zach, appreciate the time. Good luck this season. Thank you. Have a good one. Zach Bailey, Tim Crowley. Let's send it back inside the studio for more sports beat. Congratulations again to Hofstra Baseball on their championship victory last season. Make sure to check out our Instagram at Hofstra SB and our YouTube page for an exclusive interview with head coach Frank Kenelanato. Shifting back to basketball, the Hofstra men's basketball team has won their last 10, and they sit at number one in the CAA. Here to talk to all things men's hoops are Imani Washington and Jalen Tart. Now, guys, 
Ever since January 16th, it's been nothing but W's for this Hofstra Pride team. I'll start with you, Jalen. What has impressed you most about the win streak? It's been the Hofstra defense with this impressive 10-game win streak for the Pride. They're currently ranked third in the CAA with a defense efficiency of 66.07. That's third in the CAA. And offensively, they've been poured in on teams with shooting all around from top to bottom going 73.7 points per game in the CAA. I think Coach Claxton has laid out a balanced plan throughout the whole conference play to be so consistent on both sides of the basketball and perform at such a high level during conference play. You know, for me, it's going to have to be the consistency. You know, seven of the 10 games have been won by 14 points or more, and I think the team has come out really aggressive each of those times. Um, even off the bench, everybody's been contributing really well. Everybody's been playing their part, doing their part. Um, and even the games where they weren't able to shoot as well, everybody was able to play some really good defense and ultimately come out for the win. Now, speaking of a game where they didn't necessarily put up the points they're accustomed to, that second round against Stony Brook, they won, they turned the island blue, but it was a tight contest. What was your biggest takeaway from that narrow win? I think in the last five minutes of the game, D Stone Dubar was, has been the Hong Song hero against Stony Brook, and he locked down Stony Brook's top defender, or top scorer, I should say, Tywin Stevenson Moore, who had 27 points in the game against Hofstra. And he literally said, okay, let me lock down one of the best defenders all for the game and scored zero points throughout the last five minutes of the quarter. Tyler Thomas has played phenomenally well throughout the conference play, and they literally took, they turned the whole game around the last five minutes to get this three point win over Stony Brook. Yeah, it definitely was a hard fought battle. A lot of shots that usually were made hadn't been made that game, but I think it shows how well we embrace challenge. You know, just as you were saying, D Stone had a great defensive game in the end of that game. Um, and those two big threes were definitely crucial towards the end of the game. Bryce Warren and German also had some good runs together. Um, they played very well together as well. But I think this shows how well we handle adversity and how well we're able to battle through even when things aren't going our way. Now, speaking of adversity, Hofstra topped Charleston when they were the number 18 team in the nation, and they've held the edge in the CAA standings. Of course, they also hold the tiebreaker. Are the Cougars the team to worry about if you're Hofstra heading into the CAA tournament? I think they are the team to worry about going into the tournament, knowing that in the regular season, in the conference play specifically, they, it was a back-and-forth game where Hofstra came out and won with the experienced play of Jaquan Carlos, Aaron Estrada, and Tyler Thomas. I think you're going to have to need a little bit more production on the second go-round if they do meet in the CAA championship with more bench production with D. Stone Dubar, like I said earlier, coming up play, coming up defensively. But I think they have enough weapons and tools to get the win over Charleston if they do end up meeting. But I think another good team that we that we should also point out is UNCW and, and Towson, who they both played very closely. So I think it's a tall task for, for Hofstra, but I think they can get over and, get, and win the CAA championship. Yeah, there definitely is a good chance that we could see Charleston in the CAA championship. It's been very competitive all season between Charleston and Hofstra, um, very back and forth. But um, the game that we did play against them was determined by four points. So it is going to be very competitive, but there is a good chance that we could see them. But just as Jalen was saying, Towson is also a team that I think we should keep an eye out for. Um, before the 10-game streak, um, Towson did um, overcome Hofstra by four by. Uh, good amount, and um, Hofstra beat them during our 10-game streak by four points. So I think they're definitely a team to look out for um, in this next coming time. Hofstra and Charleston certainly cutting through the CAA like a knife through butter, but there have been other sharp teams in the conference, as Jalen has pointed out. Now, shifting over to individual accolades, it's very tough to win prestigious hardware back-to-back -back seasons, but Aaron Estrada has a pretty good shot at winning CAA Player of the Year for the second straight season. Can he do it? I think he can. I think with what Aaron Estrada has shown throughout the season, he's just been unstoppable on the offensive side of the ball, scoring and getting players involved on the offensive end. He's averaging 5.5 assists, which is a great average number, and he's averaging 20.5 points per game, which is 19th in the NCAA. I think he has enough, and I think he's impressing NBA scouts if he does end up getting drafted in the NBA draft. I mean, who other than Aaron Estrada? This man has been averaging 20 points, five rebounds, and four assists throughout the entire season and has been named the CAA Player of the Week three times this season alone. The only other person who's been able to do that this year is Nicholas Timberlake, who's averaging 17 points, three rebounds, and two assists. So, I mean, you do the math there. 
Um, not to mention that he's also ranked 19th in the NCAA for overall scoring. So the man's a beast. What can I say? If he's not winning it, I don't know who is. Certainly has numbers on his side. And really quickly before we wrap, Hofstra will win the CAA if the following goes right for them. Fill in the blank. Experience and depth, I think with what they learned last year in the tournament, it's going to carry through on with what, how they're going to prepare and make a big run in the tournament. The depth portion is the bench play of German Plotnikov, Warren Williams, Tyler Thomas, Bryce Washington, Jaquan Carlos, who's been playing very significantly well the past few games. It takes a total team effort. And I think Speedy Claxton has a true blueprint of winning the CAA championship and getting a bid in the NCAA tournament. You know, if the team continues to play together as one, I think we have a really good shot here. Um, really starting to see um, how to play together. Everybody's working well, very well together. And everybody seems to be very focused heading into these next couple games. So if they continue to play together and avoid the mistakes made last year, I think we have a very good shot. Definitely playing well, controlling their own destiny with one game left on the schedule. They've done all they could to secure the top spot in the conference. Thank you, Jalen and Amani. And to get further insight into the Pride's successful season, our own Max Milstein had a chance to sit down with special assistant to the head coach of men's basketball, Colin Curtin. Let's take a look. What's up, Sports Beat fans? Today we have a very special interview. We are here in the David S. Mack Sports and Exhibition Complex, the home of the Hofstra men's and women's basketball teams. And today we are joined by special assistant to the head coach, Colin Curtin. Colin, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So I just want to start off with talking about your career in, in coaching a bit. You've been around this Hofstra team a long time, but take us back to the beginning. How did you first get into coaching? Yeah, so uh, originally I was from Philadelphia. Um, went to St. Joseph's Prep, uh, right in center, right in North Philadelphia. And uh, like everyone else, I thought I was going to be a high school basketball player, and then you know maybe play in college. But um, fortunately, I got cut from the freshman team, and I and I started working um, as a freshman as a student manager for for Speedy Morris, who was he was the coach at the time. Learned a lot through him, and then uh, when it came to picking a school for. You know, my undergraduate, um, all I wanted to do was be a part of a, a, a basketball program, a Division One basketball program. And, um, you know, uh, that's kind of where I hooked up with, with Joe Mahalik up at Niagara. And I was, you know, a manager there for four years and, and traveled with the team from day one and, and learned, you know, under him and, and all of the really good assistants that were up there. So I knew I had to do something, uh, you know, pretty crazy to, to break in. So. You know, I was up there for four years, and then uh, when, when Coach Mahalik got the job down here, and he brought the whole staff, which, you know, doesn't really happen in college basketball. Usually when a coach gets another job, he brings in new people and, and whatnot. But, you know, I was very fortunate enough for him to bring me down here, and I've been down here for 10 years, and it's been, uh, it's been awesome. Let's transition a little bit, talking about this year's team specifically. Let's just start broad. You and I are sitting here on February 6th. How has this year gone compared to your expectations at the beginning of the season? Well, yeah, you know, I, I look at the season and, and, I, and I put it into to three categories. You have your non-conference schedule, you have your conference schedule, and then, you know, the postseason. And, you know, you have to navigate each one. And we've done a really good job these last two years in scheduling up in the non-conference. We really feel like uh, it'll get us ready for CAA play. Um, and, and we did the same thing this year. And, you know, the first thing you have to do is try to navigate the non-conference and, and do some things, accomplish some things, some, some goals that you set out. And, you know, uh, I think we sit here today and we have the 15th toughest non-conference schedule in the country, which, you know, we really did challenge ourselves. I think we, we, we finished seven and six. We came out of that above 500. Um, and we played some really, really good teams and teams that will be in, in the tournament for sure. And then we turn the page and, and we, we enter conference play. It's, it's one of those things we need to keep progressing and getting better. By the time March hits, we're playing our best basketball. Getting into the nitty gritty of this roster a little bit, I think it, you could make the, a very sound argument that Aaron Estrada, Tyler Thomas has, have been the best backcourt in the CAA this season. How have each of those guys been able to grow off each other and play off each other so successfully? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. Really good players make coaches look really good. And, and that's that's what, it, what, what we have. You know, Aaron Estrada is one of the all time greats. You know, like I, I've been around here for a while and, and you know, he's, he's on the projection to win the, another CA player of the year. He's been phenomenal his two years here. And Tyler has been unbelievable in his transition. And usually it takes a year for guys to get accustomed to the system, accustomed to the players, you know, how we do, how we do business on a day-to-day -day basis and, you know, what we expect from them. And, and 
to, to his credit, he came in in the summertime and it was like he's been here for the last four years, you know? They play well off of each other. They really share the ball. They're so good that it opens up other people's games. And, you know, offensively, they really work off each other. And uh, it's hard to key in on one guy, you know? You can key in on Estrada, and then Tyler Thomas is right there willing to make a play. So, you know, Coach Mahalik's always said it. it's it's not about the X's and O's. It's about the Jimmys and the Joes. And we got some Jimmys and Joes on this team. Is kind of incredible if it, whether it's German Plotnikov, Warren Williams, Amari Marshall, or even Bryce Washington. What does it mean to be able to bring those four guys and others off the bench and have be able to be confident that they can hold it down? Yeah, it's huge because going back to what we talked about in the in the beginning, it's it's always we're always progressing to to March and very hard to win three games in three days with five players, six players. It's going to take you know a whole team to do that and. You know, these guys have all had their moments. And, uh, you know, just recently, Bryce has, has been the guy, but Amari has also been the guy. German has come off the bench, you know, against Stony Brook, and he got it going again, you know. So if we can get those guys all playing at a high level, which, you know, they're all on track to do um, and, to, and to continue to do, it makes us, I think, a little bit more dangerous in March. And, uh, you know, we have that depth. It, it's, it's depth that we haven't had in a while here, and it's... Uh, it's refreshing to go to the bench and not have a drop off. We get better, um, and not a lot of teams can say that. But um, I, I feel I feel that's the case here. Coach, thanks for the time. Best of luck. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. He's special assistant to the head coach, Colin Curtin. I'm Max Milstein. Sportsbeat fans, thanks for tuning in. There is plenty more going on in Hofstra sports this week besides basketball. Here to take you through it all is Julia Cavanaugh with your Pride Weekly Update. Hey Sports Beats fans, I'm Julia Cavanaugh and welcome to the first Pride Weekly Update of the spring semester. There's lots of action around campus with winter sports about to enter their postseason conference tournaments and spring sports opening their season this past weekend, so let's get down to business. We hit the ground running as the men's and women's track and field team will be down at Virginia Beach tomorrow for the, in for the CAA Indoor Track and Field Championships. Back here on Long Island, the baseball team will play their home opener against the Great Danes of Albany with first pitch set for 2 p.m. <laughs> The other side of the diamond, the softball team will open up the University of Georgia Classic with a doubleheader on Friday. The Pride will first square off against Lipscomb at 12.30 p.m. and then at the Georgia Bulldogs at 3 p.m. From the diamond to the hardwood, the women's basketball team will play host to the current number one seed in the CAA, the Drexel Dragons, Friday at 7 p.m. Staying on the basketball court, the men's basketball team can extend their win streak to 11 and clinch their first CAA regular season title since the 2019-2020 season with a win against Northeastern this Saturday. It will be senior day at the David S. Mack Sports and Exhibition Complex with tip-off set for 2 p.m. Now to the turf, where both men's and women's lacrosse will be on the road this weekend. Women's lacrosse will be up in Connecticut taking on the Stags of Fairfield, while the men's team will take a short trip to Queens to take on St. John's. Both games are set for a 1 o'clock start. For more information on schedules, live streams, and more, visit GoHofstra.com. That's all, unfortunately, we have for you tonight, Hofstra fans. Special thanks to our panelists, Kevin Bunk, Imani Washington, and Jalen Tart. Thanks also to our reporters, Max Milstein, Tim Crowley, Olivia Hillstead, and Julia Cavanaugh. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, at Hofstra SB, and tune in to our next episode on the Ides of March, March 15th. I'm Danny DiCrescenzo. Have a great night, and go Pride!